Okay, Pat. This is Patty O'Connor at the Virginia Holocaust Museum in Richmond, Virginia on September 13, 1998. This is an interview with Ruth Marcus. Prior to the interview, I would like to read this into the record. Ruth was born in Strasbourg, France. She had one sister. Her parents were in the winemaking business. Her father chose in 1918, after World War I, to live in Germany in, in Mainz, after the plebiscite. All three, my parents and my sisters, were killed in concentration camps. I married in 1938 and went with my husband to Brussels, Belgium, in an illegal border crossing in late 1938. We stayed in Brussels in a small apartment my husband working for a merchant. May 10th, 1940, in the early morning, the Germans invaded Belgium. My husband went to work that morning, and that was the last I saw of him for six years. I was three months pregnant, and after the war was over, I searched for him through the Red Cross in the highest office. He was found living in Portugal and did not think we survived. He was not even aware that he fathered my daughter, Yvonne. Then, in 1940, more Nazis in, were in Brussels, and we went from Brussels to Marseille, Marseille, France, which at that time was not occupied by the Germans. I had no identifications and did not wear the Jewish star, which was required to be worn by all Jews. A woman friend and I rented a little room financed by the sale of our jewelry. After a few weeks, the Germans occupied all of France. Haya supported us for a few weeks, and my friend contacted the French underground and offered our service. The underground in insisted to save my child by giving her to a French family and later to a convent with the understanding that if I would survive, she would be returned to me at once. I was arrested three weeks later and sent to Camp Rivesalt, a concentration camp near Perpignan. Perpignan. At this time, the Jews were separated from the French and the Spaniards. I was in the Jewish camp for several months until the French underground received my name and I escaped to the Spanish camp with their help. This was about during the spring in 1943. My job was to help save small children out of the Jewish camp. A Jewish man, whose son I could not help, being too old to bring out, betrayed me. I received a terrible beating by the commandant. I refused to betray my friends, the underground workers. The underground saved my life by pulling me out half dead. I continued with the underground up to the liberation in 1945. Could you please state your name and place of birth? Ruth Marcus, born in Strasbourg. How old are you? I'm now 83. What languages do you speak? I speak French, German, and hopefully without mistake, English. Where were you living before the Holocaust began? In Belgium. Could you describe your life before the Holocaust began? It was really a normal life. You know, my, at Europe, the women didn't go to work, so we had a small apartment, and my husband went to work, and we did all right, hoping that the German would never invade Belgium. Little did I know. <laughs> what kind of transportation was available in Belgium at that time? Buses, no, we didn't have a car. We didn't have, not have the money for a car. We worked late. We could make a living. What kind of education did you receive before the war? I went to college. What was the type of government in Belgium at that time? It was a democratic country. And they did know that we were refugees. They didn't give us any difficult time. What was the predominant religion in your area? 
Catholic and Protestant. Before the war, did being a Jew have more of a religious significance or a cultural significance to you? To me, more religion. Did you have any non-Jewish friends before the war? Yeah, I did. Did you have any experiences with anti-Semitism before the Not war? Not in Belgium. Where were you living when the Nazis invaded your country? In Belgium. When did they occupy? May 10th, 1940. And how old were you at that time? Let's figure back how old was I. I'm now at 83. Um, 1940 is 23, 24. Can you describe what happened when the Germans captured your city? They just came with airplanes and bombed out what, uh, not uh, really where people were living, surrounding the kind of things, and then they landed. And, uh, and we were not free anymore. What immediate restrictions did the Nazis place on the Jews? The way I, uh, the Jewish star, what I refused to take. I just, just never did take it. Never would. Did you ever worry about being caught without it? Oh, sure. What were some other experiences with the Nazi occupation? Uh, we, had, I, we had to move out of the apartment. I had to move out of the apartment and found a very nice elderly lady in the country and moved in with her. I was more protected and I, I don't blame those people to not to have a Jew in their uh, home because if they would call, have caught me, uh, they also would have been punished. So it was not just anti-Semitism that they told me to move. And they gave me, by the way, that address of that uh, lady in the country. So I moved there. So you, you received help? Yes, I received, I received help. Was there any kind of resistance or sabotage to um, try to prevent the, the Germans from entering the city? No. They came in, they just went in like they went over the Linde de Demarcation in France, the same way. They were very strong. Belgium had really no army. There was no resistance. Were you ever in a ghetto or a concentration camp? Yeah, I was in a concentration camp. Which camp were you sent to? That was much later from Marseille to Griffsalt, near Perpignan, the Pyrenees Oriental. That was a camp was divided between Jews French underground worker and Spanish people who, were again, who came over without permit. How were you discovered if you were not wearing a star? I did give you a one away before because they told me, that you know, even without a star, if you are arrested, will you tell them? They ask you, are you Jewish? Will you tell them? And I said, yes, I will. And they cut off the streets, like in a quarter. You know, if you would just make a quarter, like four or five streets on each side. And there were their quarters in Marseille. And that was, we were deported right away to the camp in Perpignan. We were arrested like the criminals we had. Things on our arms, we were like a chain going and all the trimmings. What were you told before you were deported? Nothing. What were no, you no food, no talk. What were you expecting? Better than I received. Were you transported in the trains? In the trains standing. How long were you cattle, on cattle. cattle cars? Mm -hmm. How long were you on the trains? 
from Bessier. We went first to Bessier and then also about four, six hours. No water, no toilet. Uh, just standing. And they were filled up so we couldn't fall. One helped the other. What were you thinking during that time? How lucky I was to give my child away. I listen. Did you know the people who were no. keeping? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. I did not. When did you arrive at the camp? What uh, season of the year was it? It was fall because uh, Yvonne is, no, it was about July, August, something like that. What did you see when you first arrived? Lots of people in misery. Lots of them. Not only Jewish people, the French underground workers, the Spanish people there, uh, well, not for Franco, and they, they went away. So all of them had just about the same treatment. The only treatment we had different in the Jewish camp, we had light day and night over us. It was never dark. So we could not uh, run away or it was light. So not only in the, in the barracks, but outside? Outside. Like I'm not talking time. about barracks, I'm talking about outside. Outside. Mm -hmm. Now in the French and in the Spanish, they didn't have that. Only the Jews had it. How were you treated in addition to that? What should I tell you? We had one meal. We were mistreated. The worst experience I had there, we were digging holes and putting elderly people in the hole. And then they had to cover the hole. Did any selections take place in the camp? How long were you at the camp? Until 43. Do you have any idea how many prisoners were there? No, I really don't. Most of the Jewish people at the time were deported or put in cattle uh, wagons and they put some kind of chemical in it, close the door, and after a week or 10 days, everything was stayed there open, then we had to dig a hole again to put them in there. So they, they used that instead of gas chambers? Right, we didn't have a gas chamber. Could you describe what the barracks were like at the camp? Concrete. And that's it. No cover. Were there workshops in the camp? No, mm, not for us. What was the basic routine for each day? To sit in the very what next what comes next time. There was no activity. Did you have roll call every day? No. No roll call. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. They called numbers. I had my number removed because I didn't want to look at it. And uh, uh, there were numbers, they called numbers, and when they called numbers, we knew they were shipped out. See, the number they called, they shipped out. Were there any capos? Did the guards seem to show favoritism to anyone? No. Mm -mm. Did you see any acts of kindness? <laughs> no. Mm -mm. Were men and women in the same camp? Same. Did they share the same barracks or were they separated? No, they were shared the same. Shared the same barracks. Mm -hmm. um, were there any children in the camp? Yeah. 
Were they treated the same as the adults were? Yeah, well. How did you and the other prisoners look? I don't know how we looked. We were dirty. We, we washed if it rained. And we had the same clothes on forever. There was no change. Were you ever sick while you were in no. the camp? No. Mm -mm. Did they have any kind of a hospital? Not that I know. How did the guards treat the prisoners? Some were better than others. You know, there were some of them, they were really uh, mean and, and, and if you're not, well, you're not very careful and young, they might have done something to you what you wouldn't like and, and then you just, um, I could climb very well. I went under the roof very often, stayed just under the roof, on a piece of wood. Did you come across any relatives or any friends? Mm -hmm. yeah. While you were in the camp, did you always hold on to hope, or did you just try to take one day at a time? One day at a time, but hopeful that I make it. I had one advantage very soon afterwards, since I was an underground worker, and they had, and oh, that comes later, I think I should wait with this. Um, were any friendships formed because you needed it, or, or did you try to isolate yourself? I, I isolated. So I did not want to know anybody that I could climb up uh, under the roof. Yeah. Were there any escape attempts? Yeah. Were any of them successful? No. What was the result? I just used that gun and finished them, that's it. Was there ever any resistance attempted? Very little, if any. How were you able to get free from the camp? It, there was a time when the German invaded Russia. And then they didn't have German soldiers anymore in our concentration camp. They had them from Litvak or from, I don't know where they had them from, but they didn't speak German and they didn't speak uh, uh, any language, French or anything. They had their own language. And um, at that time, uh, the underground thought I, they could get me out of the Jewish camp and put me in the Spanish camp where I was more secure, and that's the only thing. And how, how do they manage to get you out of the camp? At night. At night. Mm -hmm. They say they have to go in and uh, get somebody, somebody did something bad or whatever they told them and that they got me out. Were you called a partisan or a freedom fighter? Was there a special name? Underground worker. Underground worker? Mm -hmm. Did you join a, a group that was already active? Yes. Mm -hmm. And how old were you when you first joined the underground workers? Maybe a, a year later. I was maybe, maybe not quite a year in the Jewish camp. I was very, very lucky. When you escaped from the camp, was there any resistance from the other Jews in the camp? Were they worried about retaliation? No, I volunteered to take their food in every day. That means potatoes and put a lot of bags on top of it. And if I saw a, a little girl, I just put it under the side controller. She can't cry or put something in their mouth. And I saved her like this. And then the underground did take her out to a farm. And I don't know, they were sent to a home for, of children. Was that your major task? To that was all I did. How did you feel as you did your task? I was grateful for every child. Being a mother myself, it 
was very important to me to do that job. I know it was dangerous. At the end, it, it was very dangerous, but I still wanted to do it. Did you have any contact with your daughter during that time? No. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. None at all. What were some of the major dangers involved in what you were doing? That somebody would tell on me. The children usually were quiet. They were about two, three years old, and you could more or less give them, we had always something to give them, then I had to gag them, that they don't speak. And I, I make it quickly from one came to the commandeur, and from there on they did take over. Where were the children taken? In homes, I really don't know. In children's homes, or uh, at the time, uh, later on, I know I'd, after the war when I was uh, working with Red Cross, uh, they were sent most of them later on to Israel to orphanage because the parents were killed. Was your underground unit um, all Jews or was it no. a mixed unit? Mixed. <coughs> in, in my region, I was the only Jewish person. But we didn't care anymore what we were. Where did you live when you were working with the underground? In uh, near Barsak, in the woods. How did you live in the woods? How did you get food and shelter? We did steal. Did any yeah. of the, did any of the local people help, help us. you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was there any worry about them? They would tell on us. In? No, it was just cold in the winter, but I only had a short time against counting what the others had. Did you have an underground name? No, same name. Did you have any special identification? Right after the war, I got the Kordegea. That is uh, something they gave somebody who did well for the country. Like a, a medal of honor? A medal of honor. Were you in contact with any of the family camps? No. Was underground work, work uh, widespread in France? Yes, very. Mm -hmm. And very many young people did not make it. The last two months we received uh, from England food and bombs, what we could deport to another underground. So, and I had a bicycle and I drove from one camp to the next to to help, because we were in the mountains. I don't know if you know, Rodez is full of mountains. And, and there where we located. I mean, they located before I came. I was the only woman. <laughs> was that an advantage to your group in some ways, for it being mountainous and forests? It gave us more protection. Did you have much contact with the other partisan groups? No. Not much, only when I bought them, when we got it. enough for us, then we gave it to them. We usually shared very much. And they were not far from us, really. Was your group involved in any kind of military operations? Yes. Could you describe some of those? They bombed the Germans wherever they could see the things we had. When once we had the bomb there, they bombed them out, and there were many, many of them did not survive. How did you get your information? Oh, you'd be surprised. <laughs> we get the, that they would come in, uh, uh, from England. Usually there were three lights, but they had switched on on the plane before it, it, they put it down. So we, we saw it, we knew we were safe. You usually had a, a drop-off point? Drop-off point. Parachutes. Mm -hmm. About how much territory did you cover during your work? If you a kilometer, about 25, 30, from one to the other. Did you have any weapons? I did. 
What kind of weapons did you use? Bombs. I, I personally, you mean guns? No, I didn't have any. Had you received any kind of training to prepare you for that kind of work? No. <laughs> just a volunteer. It didn't matter what I was doing. I just was out of the camp and I wanted to help my country as much as I could. But I wasn't frightened. What were some of the other problems in the life of being an underground worker? To be an underground worker was only that we had, we slept in the woods, we had some blankets, and in the winter it was very cold. We had plenty to eat. And I ate too much first because coming out of camp, so I, and my stomach was sick all the time. But we had no, we were controlled by uh, Montpellier. That was the headquarters they were assembled there. And they told us about when we could expect we get bombed. And then I had on the bicycle some bags and we put the, the bombs in and I went to the next camp and delivered and went back home. Were you ever worried or scared on, on those missions, traveling like that? Sure. But not scared enough to say I don't do it. Were you ever sick at any time when you were doing that work? Right, uh, right coming to the, out of the concentration camp because I had a terrible beating uh, before I came. That's why that did take me out. I uh, lost my teeth. Everything here was open. But I did not say, oh, the co-workers are who gives direction to me. They knew they were in camp. And I did not speak. I did not give away. To their thought, I, she dies now, but I, I didn't. <laughs> did you work with the underground until France was until liberated? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How were you notified about the war ending? Oh, we knew that right away to our radio. We had contact. Mm -hmm. Then I went to Montpellier. And there I worked for a long time as an interpreter from, from German to English. So, so I, that's what I did too. I came to the United States. I became friendly with the ambassador of the United States. And he was the one who, who pushed me. I had basically a priority visa, they called it. And I had a free transport here. Did you come over by boat? Yes. Mm -hmm. I had to go to Lisbon to kick the boat because I could not go to Spain having a French passport. And how did you get the priority visa? It was a reward. So when did you come to America? What was the date? 1946. It's, who is my passport? Yeah, know. it's exactly the day in it. I, I really don't know anymore. What were your feelings when you first came to America? I was lost. I came to New York where I stayed with the family of a cousin of, our, of my of family. And it, um, we had one room, and I was helped by the French embassy on a pension fund. And, uh, but I looked for work <coughs> right away, and I found something. So I brought her in the morning to school, and I did take the subway to work, and for her, like I stopped and picked her up again. And you, did you say you went to school? To learn, did you go to school to learn the English language? Yes, I went here to school. What was one of the biggest adjustments to the change here? I was here, you know, 
I didn't have a husband anymore. I realized that after the war, you know. So um, I was here four or five weeks, and I met my husband. We are married 51 and a half years. <laughs> it was the greatest thing ever could have happened to me. He was the first one to ask me, do you need money? I said, no, I, I don't, because I was very handy and I could do several things. And I know Yvonne was very well taken care of and we were together. Was he a survivor also? No. He was in the American Army. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Had he been over in France? He he'd been over in France. Mm -hmm. But you didn't meet. Till no, you we were here. we met here to uh, just an acquaintance. To I I didn't know anybody more. But at work somebody said, you know, there's a young man who speaks fluent French. Why don't you meet him? <laughs> we did meet. <laughs> and did your daughter come over with you? Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and your child I had my you? daughter back one day after the war started. You see that picture out there. One day, she was a big girl. Did you tell others about your experience? Not really. When did you begin telling people about what happened? Never. Besides my husband, uh, and, and they don't ask me much. I have two grandsons. Uh, they ask sometimes, and I say a few things. The older one said, Keith, leave Nanny alone. She doesn't like to talk about it. So I, I really never talked about it. Does your daughter Yvonne remember much about what happened? No. She remembered that we were separated, and she remembered that she was in a convent. She, she had to remember that. And when she saw me, she ran to me. They never left me. <laughs> Have you had any nightmares since then? I'm afraid so. Have you ever returned to France? To France, yeah, but not Germany. I wouldn't go there. Did you return to uh, where you had grown up? Where you originally mm -hmm. lived? It was nicely bombed by the American. My parents' home. It didn't matter anymore. They were not alive anyway. Did you ever return to Brussels? <laughs> if you've not not already shared your most vivid memory, could you could you share that with us now? I prefer not. It's just too tough on me, to be honest. The worst was that I realized that my husband saved himself. Didn't even bother, didn't know that a, a little girl was born in the meantime. What followed up there, that was the worst I had to experience. Worse than the concentration camp. To be just, they don't make it. And I did. And I saved my child. Have you been able to separate your feelings for the Nazis from the German people? To me, they're all the same. And I'm, I hate to say it, I, 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 I just, I just can't, can't go there. I don't care whether they're writing the paper now or not. I understand certainly the language, but I wouldn't go. We went very often to Europe. And we went to Switzerland, and uh, my father, my husband is German, and he lost his father when he was five years old. He went to Germany to the cemetery, and I went to Strasbourg to friends of ours. There's also one person survived in that whole family. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, it's just, uh, there was, Payback out, the survivor list, they called it. You know, there you could check if you find something in it. And I found Claude in it from Strasbourg. So we, ever since we are in touch, we talked this morning to him. Very much in touch, but that's as far as it goes. 
Is there anyone else that you wish that you could contact? No. I have very many friends here. And they're not all Jewish. They have, I have, I think even my best friend is Christian. And it doesn't make any difference to me. we very close. And once in a while, I can tell her something. But then I say, Martha, let's cut it off. <laughs> and so we cut it off. And I can't tell you that. <laughs> How did the Holocaust change your life? I'm more understanding for the underprivileged. I have more sympathy and I see old people and they're mistreated, things like that, they bother me a great deal. Um, the unjustice we have sometimes here in the country. And even what bothers me, and I certainly don't agree with Clinton, because he lied, he did terrible things. But why put it all over the world? That's something I don't understand. But maybe I'm not born here, that's why I don't understand it. I, I don't understand it. I couldn't also, and uh, now we don't have any more black or white. You know, I was once in a bus uh, 50 years ago, and I was in the back of seat empty. Now when they sit, the chauffeur said, you can't sit there. I said, but I'm not going to stand up. So uh, he still said, you can't sit here. You have to go get out on the next stage. I said, OK, I do that, but to that time I sit. What one lesson do you think that we should learn from remembering the Holocaust? Basically, you were not, uh, I was not either in Dachau, where it was a very bad concentration camp, they had the gas. What should we remember? That it never happened again. I don't care what kind of religion you are. I know I'm Jewish, and I think we're equal. We should do right. We should do right for that country, what I love dearly. Ever grateful I could come here. I am. Do you think there's any way to explain to children what happened? There is. Uh, Yvonne, my daughter, uh, uh, works at the school in Tucker. Uh, and she came one day to me and she said, you know, Mommy, they, tell me, they asked me something to say about our background. What can I say? And two of us made up something very not too bad because I didn't want her to be hurt either. Just, just tell them you were separated from your mother and the nuns were just wonderful to you. You were a fit little thing where many people didn't have anything to eat. See, I really, and my two grandsons, uh, uh, they accepted the way. They're, no. And they're very, very thoughtful that I, I do not talk about. Because uh, in the meantime, I had open heart surgery and I have a weak heart. And I did not like it much to come here. But I did come. And I don't regret it. And we're grateful, too. How do you answer people who say it never happened? It doesn't, didn't happen to me yet. I think I would, <laughs> would be ugly. <laughs> because it did happen. Did you ever go to Germany and go in a camp like Dachau? Did you ever go in? Yes. Okay, then you know. Mm -hmm. I could not find my parents' name or my sister's name anywhere. I went all to all the camps just looking for a name. 
sometimes they registered them. I couldn't find them, so I assumed they were guests. I mean, right away. I, it's an assumption. I really don't know. And you know, I may be the only person in the America I did not ask for it. You know, most of them asked and they paid monthly uh, rent or something. They couldn't pay me enough. I did not want their money. I didn't ask. I didn't want it. Do you see any dangers in America or other parts of the world today? I don't, I don't think the American, they're not dumb enough to do things like that. We have educated people here. Regardless what happened with the government, I think uh, it's a great country. And you, they don't mind if you have an accent or they're tolerant. And I just love it. Do you have any last memory that you would like to share? You mean from the concentration camp? From, from anything during that time? That young boy of seven years I couldn't save. That, that bothers me. Still gives me to think about. I couldn't do it, could only use small one. And he was really a big boy. The parents were deported next mm. day with him, and, and that still bothers me. And I couldn't do it, I really couldn't do it. I could save little children two years old, but I couldn't save seven, eight-year-old boy. Just couldn't do it. Do you know how many children you did help save? Oh, uncalled for. Every day, half a dozen. And still, that wasn't all. There were one child, and I only could do it once a day. Well, thank you for sharing with us. I know it was hard for you. We appreciate it. You were very easy on me. Thank you very much. Now I'm sorry. I didn't maybe answer everything the way you wanted.